Hello and welcome to Memory Lesson 7. This is the first of three lessons that looks at what memory research can tell us about the dependability of eyewitness testimony, focusing specifically on what can impact um, an eyewitness testimony, but also on how we can improve eyewitness testimony. So in this lesson, we're going to look at the effects of misleading information on eyewitness testimony. Um, in the next lesson, which is lesson eight, we'll look at the impact of anxiety on eyewitness testimony. And in lesson nine, we're going to look at how the quality of eyewitness testimony can be improved through the cognitive interview. And the links to those videos will appear at the end, um, but they should also be appearing on your screen right about now as well. So just to get us started, we're going to have a quick look at two key terms that we are going to need for this lesson. The first is eyewitness testimony and the second is misleading information. Eyewitness testimony refers to an account given by people of an event that they've witnessed, usually a crime of some kind. So for example, they might be required to give a description um, at a trial, let's say, of a robbery or road accident that they've seen. Misleading information, however, is incorrect information that has been given to an eyewitness, usually after the event, which can distort what they remember about that event. And misleading information can take a lot of different forms, but for the purposes of this lesson and for A-level psychology, we are going to focus on two specific types, and that is leading questions and post-event discussion. Um, so here we go. Leading questions are questions that are phrased in such a way that they imply or lead us to a specific answer. So, for example, a teacher may say to a student, you haven't done your homework, have you? Even though the teacher doesn't really know either way, but the question is phrased in such a way that implies that the student's answer should be, no, I haven't done my homework. Equally, a police officer might ask roughly how far over the speed limit was the car driving, implying that the car was in fact speeding, even though the police officer doesn't know either way. Now, leading questions is a particular issue for eyewitness testimony because police questions may direct a witness to give a particular answer, which then of course means that the witness may no longer be answering in a way that they want to answer. Leading Questions was investigated in a key study conducted by Loftus and Palmer in 1974. Loftus and Palmer arranged for 45 participants to watch film clips of car accidents, and then they asked them questions about the accident. There was always one critical question, which was a leading question. And in that question, the participants were asked to describe how fast the cars were travelling when they hit each other. Now, there were five groups of participants, and each group was given a different verb in the critical question. So one group heard how fast were the cars travelling when they hit each other, but then the word hit was substituted with contacted, bumped, collided, or smashed. And Loftus and Palmer found that the mean estimate speed for the group who heard the word contacted was 38.8 miles per hour. However, for the verb smashed, the mean speed estimate was 40.5 miles per hour, which suggests that the leading question had actually biased the eyewitness's recall of the event. Okay, so you can see on the screen there that the blue bar in the bar chart on the left-hand side was for the verb smashed, whereas the yellow bar in the bar chart on the right-hand side was for the verb contacted. Okay, so the critical question clearly impacted the recall of the witnesses um, when they were asked it. Now, there are two reasons why leading questions affect eyewitness testimony, and those are something called the response bias explanation, and then there's a second one called the substitution bias explanation. The response bias explanation suggests that the wording of the question doesn't really have any effect on the participants' memories, however, it influences how they decide to answer. So when a participant gets a leading question using the word smash, it encourages them to choose a higher speed estimate, even though their actual memory might be of a lower speed. So the question affects our answer, but it leaves the memory intact. 
Whereas the substitution bias proposes that the wording of the question actually changes the participant's memory of the event. And to investigate that further, Loftus and Palmer actually conducted a second experiment. And they found that participants who originally heard the word smashed were more likely to later report seeing broken glass on the floor, even though there was any, than participants who heard the verb hit. Okay, so that supports this idea that the critical verb actually altered their memory of the incident because the participants are reporting seeing something that wasn't actually there, i.e. the broken glass. Okay, so try to remember the, um, the two reasons why leading questions actually affect us. It might be nice for a six mark outline to be able to put something like that in, particularly if the essay is only about leading questions. Okay, but we'll come to that a little bit later on when we have a look at some exam questions. The second type of misleading information is called post-event discussion. Now, post-event discussion occurs when there is more than one witness to an event and when the witnesses actually discuss what they've seen with each other or with other people, which could, of course, influence the accuracy of each individual witness's recollection of the event. Now, post-event discussion was investigated by Gabbett et al. in 2003. In their study, participants were partnered up and then each partner watched a video of the same crime, but filmed from different points of view. So that meant that each partner could see elements of the event that the other partner couldn't see. For example, one of the partners was able to see the title of a book being carried by a woman. After they'd watched the video, the pairs were then put into a room together and they were allowed to discuss what they'd seen. And it was found that 71% of the participants mistakenly recalled aspects of the event that they didn't see in the video, but had picked up in the discussion with their partner. In the control group, where there was no discussion after watching the video, the figure was 0%. Okay, so that shows that post-event discussion can quite considerably change what you remember about an event. As with leading questions, there are two explanations as to why post-event discussion actually affects us. And these are memory contamination and memory conformity. Memory contamination is when witnesses to a crime discuss it with each other and then their eyewitness testimonies become altered or distorted because they end up combining information from the other witnesses with their own memories. Whereas memory conformity is the fact that witnesses go along with each other to either win social approval or because they think that the other witnesses are right and they are wrong. So very much a normative social influence or informational social influence kind of reasoning behind it. Unlike with memory contamination, the actual memory is not changed in this case. Okay, the memory is changed in memory contamination, but the memory is not changed in memory conformity. Okay, so just very quickly then, um, there are a couple of note-taking slides for you here. I've given you quite a lot of information, so feel free to pause at any point. Here's the uh, Loftus and Palmer study, and then here is the Gabbett study as well. Again, just written out for you so that you can make sure that you've got everything that you need. Okay, so I've just got a few little tips for you when it comes to exam questions. Now, obviously, this topic can come up in all of the different forms which you would expect. Short answer questions, application questions, evaluation questions. I imagine you've been doing psychology for long enough now to be able to kind of figure out what questions could come up. However, if this comes up as an essay, like this, for example... Outline and evaluate research, theories or studies into the effect of misleading information on eyewitness testimony for 16 marks. There is a, in my opinion, there is a certain format to follow which is most likely going to get you the top marks. Okay, so if, if I were you, I would start with a brief introduction to misleading information. I would move on to explaining what leading questions are. I would outline Loftus and Palmer's study, as in the findings and the procedure. Then I will talk about what post-event discussion is, and I would say why it works. Okay, so in the question, it is asking you for theories and or studies. However, I wouldn't just talk about theories, and I also wouldn't just talk about studies. So I would start off with a little bit of research, as in studies, and then I would end with 
post-event discussion, don't talk about Gabbert's research, but then you can bring in why it works. Okay, so you've got a nice little mix of leading questions, then research, study, and then post-event discussion plus what it is. So it's a nice mix of study and theory. What you could, of course, also get is outline and evaluate research into the effects of leading questions on eyewitness testimony or into the effects of post-event discussion on eyewitness testimony. And you could probably get that for 16 or 8 marks. Now, if you get that as a 16 marker, I would follow a very similar kind of procedure and I would talk about an introduction to what leading questions actually are. Then I would talk about the research study conducted by Loftus and Palmer followed by talking about the substitution bias and the response bias as reasons why it actually works. Okay, so if that comes up as a 16 marker, it's a little bit trickier because you need to make sure that you get everything in about leading questions or about post-event discussion if that's what it's about. If you only get an 8 marker on that, it's less tricky because you have three marks in your outline to be able to talk about it. And in that case, it really doesn't matter whether you have theories or studies because it's only three marks and you can get through that quite quickly. Okay, so we're just going to finish off with a couple of evaluation points now. I've got four for you. Um, I've got one strength and three limitations. Obviously, my four are just the four that I've chosen for this topic. There are, of course, loads more out there depending on which book you're using. So feel free to sub out any that you don't need. Okay, so let's have a look. Um, the first one is a real-world application, which is effectively saying that research into misleading information has got brilliant real-world applications because the consequences of an inaccurate eyewitness testimony can be devastating. So research into this kind of area has led to police officers changing their questioning techniques in order to kind of avoid distorting information that the witnesses can provide. Okay, so... The research has made a positive difference to people's lives, um, and so that is definitely a strength. You have, however, also got a counterpoint to that, which effectively says that even though the practical applications are great, there is a lot of issues with the research which you have to take into account. So, for example, Loftus and Palmer did a lab study which involved people watching videos, and so watching a video in the lab can't necessarily replicate certain elements of seeing a real life event like re reproduce the stress that's associated with witnessing an event also in the real world remembering what happened has got very important consequences um, because you know it could be the difference between somebody going to jail or not however in research studies responses don't really matter in the same way which means that participants might be less motivated to be accurate Okay, so that definitely has an effect on the research outcomes. The third point is a little bit of evidence against memory conformity. Now, Skagerberg and Wright in 2008 did a study that was very similar to Gabba et al.'s study. They showed their participants video clips. There were two versions. Um, they got participants to discuss the clips in pairs, having seen different versions. So very similar to Gabba et al. Um, however, the results showed that the participants didn't report what they'd seen in their clips, but they also didn't report what they'd heard from their co-witnesses. What they actually found was that the participants tended to blend the two versions together. So, for example, in one version, there was a woman with dark brown hair, and in another version, there was a woman with light brown hair. And the participants reported seeing a woman with medium brown hair rather than dark or light. That suggests that memory itself is distorted through contamination by post-event discussion. It doesn't suggest that there's any kind of memory conformity going on. So the study shows that memory is more likely to be distorted through contamination rather than be distorted through memory conformity. Now, your final evaluation point is some evidence against the substitution bias explanation for leading questions. Now, Sutherland and Hain in 2001 conducted some research where they showed participants a video clip and then subsequently asked them some misleading questions. And they found that the participants' recall was more accurate for the core details of the event than it was for the peripheral ones. So presumably what had happened was 
that the participants' attention was focused on the important details of the event, and those memories were quite resistant to misleading information. And the peripheral details that were less important, those were more likely to get distorted because they weren't as important. So that suggests that the original memories for important details actually survived and weren't affected by misleading information. And that's an outcome that is not predicted by the substitution bias explanation because that explanation just suggests that the entire memory is distorted and not just certain elements of it. So that is your fourth evaluation point, and with it, that is also the end of the video. So there's been a lot of information there. Feel free to go back over it and just make sure that you are happy with everything. If you've got any questions, please feel free to pop them in the comment section below, and I will do my best to get back to you ASAP. I hope it's all made sense, and I hope it's been useful, and thank you very much for listening.